But all right, gang. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get this. Uh, what do we call this? The TGN Morning Show? The TGN Morning Show. I, I like it. I think that's got real potential. TGN Morning Show, where the best news you're going to hear all day is going to be talked about. All right, let's uh, let's open up the paper. Here's our newspaper for the morning. <laughs> November 6th, the best news in the house. Ministry from Galilee to Judah. After the festival of dedication, uh, again, Hanukkah, right? Jesus apparently returns to Capernaum for the final two months of his Galilean ministry. He not only feels growing opposition from the people there who want a political leader, but also knows that it is nearing the time for him to be delivered up. From this time forward, Jesus resolutely faces his final suffering. I love the word resolute. He is, he's turned his face as flint towards what is in front of him, uh, towards his final suffering. As he sets out on his journey to Jerusalem, Samaria, he in Samaria, he again encounters immediate rejection making what amounts to a final appeal to the northern region. Jesus sends out 72 of his disciples to whom he gives the power to heal in his name with the mission of proclaiming the coming of his kingdom. Jesus proceeds down through Judah. He apparently uh, is a, near Jer uh, Jericho when he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, an illustration all the more remarkable in view of Jesus' own rejection by the Samaritans just a short time before. Jesus will travel, then travel on to Bethany, visiting the home of Martha and Mary, later proceed to Jerusalem for the Festival of Jet Dedication. This is a time of transition for the Master. Initial excitement among the masses is followed by doubt and even hostility as Jesus refuses to accept the role that most people want him to play. In a way, it is characteristic of the turnabout which inevitably comes when people accept Jesus into their lives for any number of wrong reasons. The excitement can give way to disappointment. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he set messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? Because that makes sense. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. On his, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. And do not greet anyone on the road. 
When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give, give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable in the day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if, it, if the miracles that are performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted into the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 repeat, returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by, by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. And he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on <coughs> oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. 
She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Whether intentionally present for the festival or there for other reasons, Jesus is in Jerusalem in December during the eight-day festival of dedication known more modernly as Hanukkah. This festival was instituted as recently as 164 BC by Judas Maccabeus in commemoration of refurbishing of the temple after it had been profaned for idolatrous use in 169 BC, 168 BC, excuse me, by Antichus Epiphanes. Epiphanes. Faithful Jews are gathered in Jerusalem in order to celebrate the rededication of the temple, and Jesus takes this opportunity to reach out to the large number of people present. When various Jewish leaders ask Jesus whether he is Christ, he reminds them of his miraculous works as proof of his deity. He then says that he and the Father are one, thereby infuriating the Jews who see this as, uh, as rank blasphemy. They take up rocks to stone Jesus and try to have him arrested, but Jesus escapes. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking <clears throat> Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because um, you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, it is not written in your law, I have said you are gods. Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe in the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. 
Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days, where he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, any observations? We're going to look at a Bible overview of the second part of, uh, of Luke today. But before we do that, uh, any observations from something, anything that was read? Mark, the, the notion that there was growing opposition that, um, you know, among the people who believed in Jesus, and, and it's interesting to me because I find myself thinking, so what, where does this opposition come from? Part of it is maybe um, faulty expectations. You know, they, I, I think they, they thought, and I think we've read it before, they figured that Jesus was going to come and overthrow He's going to overthrow the government. He's going to sit on the throne. We're going to have this new king and, and away we go. And he's not doing it. Mm -hmm. And they had those expectations that he was going to be something that he never claimed he was going to be or do. Mm -hmm. But yet they kept putting it on him. You know, it's like, okay, now we're going to tell you what to do, Jesus. Here, here's how you're going to fix stuff for us. And it's interesting to me how, how, in spite of all the miracles, of all the good that he does, they resist and they reject him. I like how he appeals, too, to their knowledge that there's, there's good works that you're observing and you're knowing that the good works, the type of works with which I'm engaging, can only come from one place. And, uh, and so I appeal to your, your recognition that this has to be coming from the hand of the Father. And, uh, and yet, they just can't seem to, to get there. You know, they can't allow that, that line of reasoning to impact their heart. But it should have. Do you think that if they truly didn't think he was God's son, that they would have felt that threatened by him, though? Or do you think that you know, they did. And he was saying things that ultimately would turn upside down their way of kind of their heart hierarchy and the religion. And so therefore he was a threat regardless of being God. Yeah. I think the, the old adage, uh, prying away <laughs> keys and guns and pews from the hands of old men stands to reason, you know, <clears throat> they don't like giving up power. People don't want to give up titles or prestige or power or the or their perception of power and and uh, and he's coming with a uh, an ideology that is so unique they cannot get their hearts around it. So, all right, let's take a look at uh, the Luke Bible overview and then we'll come back and take a peek at some questions. The Gospel according to Luke. In the first video, we explored Luke's portrayal of John the Baptist and Jesus as the fulfillment of the story of Israel and of God's promises told in the Old Testament scriptures. We then watched Jesus launch his mission and bring the good news of God's kingdom to the poor among Israel, people of low social status and also people who are outsiders. And Jesus taught that his kingdom is upside down. It's a reversal of all of our common social values. This section culminated with Luke showing us how Jesus was a new Moses about to bring a new exodus by his death in Jerusalem. And so we come to the large center section of the book where Jesus leads his newly formed Israel on a journey to Jerusalem. This part of the book consists mainly of Jesus' teaching and parables given on the road to the various people he encounters, mainly his growing group of disciples. And in this way, Luke portrays following Jesus as a journey. It's something you do where you learn as you go along life's path. So first, Jesus invites his disciples into his mission as he sends a wave of them to go ahead of him, announcing God's kingdom. So being a disciple right from the start, it means participating in Jesus' kingdom mission, making it your own. 
And as Jesus' disciples come back, he then starts to give various teachings about prayer, about trusting in God's provision. It's actually in these chapters of Luke that Jesus talks more about money, possessions, and generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. If following him is truly like being on the road, it should produce this minimalist mentality, creating a freedom from possessions that allows for radical generosity. Another key theme in these chapters is Jesus' continued mission to the poor. So as he travels, he keeps forming his new Israel, and he encounters all these people who are sick or blind. He meets Samaritans who are ancient enemies of the Jewish people. And famously, Zacchaeus, a Jewish man, but who heads up tax collection for the Romans. All of these social outsiders meet Jesus, and they're transformed by the encounter. And so they join his kingdom community, which Jesus describes as a great banquet party. He is here to seek and save the lost, and so he's celebrating when people discover the mercy of God. But not everybody at the party is happy. Luke includes multiple stories of Jesus at banquets with Israel's leaders, and these all become heated debates where Jesus confronts their pride and hypocrisy. And so these contrasting banquet parties, they're captured most memorably in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. So a father had two sons, and one foolishly ran away and squandered his inheritance. But he comes back eventually repentant, and his father forgives him, and he throws this huge party to celebrate my son who was lost but now is found. But the older brother, who never left his father, he's angry, and he resents his father's generosity to this undeserving son. In this famous parable, Jesus is explaining his whole kingdom mission to these leaders. His parties represent God's joyous welcome of every kind of person into his family. The only entry requirement is humility and repentance. And so it highlights the tragedy of Israel's leaders who reject Jesus and his upside-down kingdom community. And this resistance to Jesus, it ramps up, and he finally arrives in Jerusalem for Passover. As he nears the city, he's weeping. His disciples are hailing him as the Messianic king, but Israel's leaders are denouncing him. And he knows that their rejection of his kingdom of peace is going to set Israel on a road of resistance and rebellion against the Roman Empire, it will bring the city's downfall. And it's that destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus symbolically enacts. As he storms into the temple and he runs out the animal cellars, he brings the sacrificial system to a halt. And he says that this place of worship has become a den of rebels and will be destroyed. Now this act, of course, generates a whole series of debates between Jesus and Israel's leaders, all leading up to Jesus' prediction that the Roman armies will one day surround this city, it will desolate it and the temple all within a generation. With that, Jesus retreats with his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal. It's the annual symbolic meal about Israel's liberation from slavery through the death of the lamb. And so Jesus turns the meal's bread and wine into new symbols about this new exodus. His broken body, his shed blood, will bring liberation for Jesus' renewed Israel. After the meal, Jesus is arrested and he's examined before the Jewish leaders and then put on trial as one claiming to be king. And Luke emphasizes Jesus' innocence. Pilate, the Roman governor, he claims that Jesus is innocent three times before giving in. Even Herod, the ruler of Galilee, finds nothing to accuse Jesus of. But the leaders finally compel Pilate to have him crucified, and so he is. But even in his painful death, Jesus embodies the love and the mercy of God he taught so much about. He offers God's forgiveness to the soldiers as they crucify him. And then when one of the criminals executed alongside Jesus realizes who he actually is, he says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus' final words are an offer of hope to a humiliated criminal. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so with this last act of generosity and kindness, Jesus dies. His body's placed in a tomb, and on the first day of the week, some of Jesus' disciples come to the tomb only to find it empty. And there are two angelic figures there telling them that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead, and so they leave with their minds blown. And it's right here that Luke tells one of his most beautiful stories. Two of Jesus' disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem for a town called Emmaus, and they're heartbroken over Jesus' death. And then suddenly, Jesus is there, just walking alongside them, but they don't recognize him. 
he asks why they're so sad, and they go on to talk about all of their hopes, that Jesus would have been the one to redeem Israel. But now he's dead. It was all for nothing. But then later, as Jesus has a meal with these two, he breaks bread for them, just as he did at the Passover meal, and it's in that moment that they recognize him, then he disappears. Luke is telling this story to make a powerful point about following Jesus. When Jesus' disciples impose their agenda and their view of reality on Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown to them. It's only when we submit ourselves to the upside-down kingdom of Jesus that's epitomized in his broken body on the cross, offered in self-giving love, it's only then that we see and know the real Jesus. The book's concluding scene is yet another meal. As Jesus appears to his disciples and he explains to them from the Old Testament scriptures how this was all a part of God's plan, that the Messiah would become Israel's king by suffering and dying for their sins and conquering their evil with his resurrection life. And so now, as Simeon the prophet promised back in chapter 2, Jesus' kingdom will move outward from Israel so God's forgiveness can be announced to the nations and everyone invited to follow Jesus. But, Jesus tells his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit to empower them for this new mission. And this, of course, keeps you reading right into Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. But for now, that's the gospel according to Luke. That is quite a, quite an overview. I love that they capture the notion of the what I like to refer to as the inverted gospel, or what they call the upside down kingdom. Uh, the you know the ones who gain their lives are the ones who lose it, and the ones who uh, fight to uh, uh, have their lives are the never able to never able to find it. So. Pretty, pretty profound uh, stuff in the overview. I think it also carries the reflection of the author who is Luke, who's a physician, who's a doctor, mm -hmm. and he's the one who's writing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that goes to portray the, uh, the scientific side of this whole thing. Yeah. He brings a, an element of exacting in his nature of writing, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and, and Mark, in that video, I thought it was interesting when, when the uh, presenter made the comment that when we impose our views on Jesus, he remains hidden. Yeah. Right? Right. You can't see him when you're, when you're wanting your view of him to be what's seen. And when you want to submit, all of a sudden... Things start to open up. Yeah, and it's like you begin to see when you when you when you want what you want, you can't see. When you want what he wants, a clarity comes that you can't even imagine. Amen. I love that too. That's a great. That was a great uh, great way of framing it that I had never I had never put into that parable at the end. There, we'll get to revisit that in some in some measure in a few in a week or two. Um, but how does God, how does Jesus want you to respond to the work he performs in your life? How does Jesus want you to respond to the work he performs in your life? One of the things that I think <clears throat> it, that hit me is that he said to the, the leper that returned, your faith has saved you. And, you know, Paul often says it is by grace that we are saved. But he was telling the, the leper, it is your faith that saved you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and that that idea of gratitude yeah. comes through in the chat. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's such a big tendency for us to want to take credit for everything that happens in our life at least when it's good we want to blame bad things on the world or circumstances or god or whatever but when it's good we want that to be our own doing and so i've just encountered in my life that jesus really wants us to give god the glory and give him the glory for what he's done in our life and i think that's really when Dustin and I talk about our marriage, that's, that's the point we always try to make is that 
we were a mess and God came in and did amazing things that we believe he can do in any relationship. Um, we weren't special. We weren't, um, it wasn't anything we did. It was God coming in saying, um, you know, I'm going to restore this and make it something greater. And our message is that God can do that for you. That's really what we try to, how we try to praise the work he's done in our marriage. Right. You know, when it comes down to a lot of times the, the uh, kind of the Henry, Harry, Henry Blackaby's concept, when you look for uh, what God is doing and see ways with which you can join him, there's real power in that in contrast to uh, trying to uh, ask God to join you in your agenda. And I think in marriage, that's really true. Asking God, what are you trying to do in this marriage? And then how can we partner with you and join you in that? is fundamentally different than uh, the other way around. Yeah, it still requires work on our end. I mean, God does great things and work, but that, I mean, it felt like we were training for the Olympics. I mean, every day was, it was a lot of work, especially when things were super tough. And so, you know, you can't always just sit and on your couch and think, well, God's gonna come and bless me and do all these great things. No, I mean, Jesus says, you, you know, my love is action. You need to go and take action with what I'm giving you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are the trappings of being wise and learned? I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Well, from what I, from what I've heard, <laughs> the uh, you know I, I can figure this out on my own. Mm -hmm. I've got the answers. And, and I think when, when you fall into that, that category of, I've got this all figured out and calculated, uh, that's a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. God, God is too big for us to be able to figure out. And yet I think there are people out there who think they've got it figured out. What's so fascinating to me is whenever, you know, when, whenever you have much, uh, you run risk of reliance and whether that's much money, much knowledge, much power, uh, wherever there's much, there tends to be uh, a real lack of tendency to rely on the Holy Spirit or the strength of God's presence or the word as your anchoring motif or modality, you wind up leaning into your own strength, your own power, your own wealth in a way that winds up being really corrupting. Have you seen that? Well, I think we see it in our politics a lot right now. I mean, on, and this isn't a partisan view. I think, you know, you get into that power and nobody's willing to listen anymore. And, you know, you get into that place where you have power that you're willing to do anything to keep it. So, I mean, I do, I think we still see that in, you know, especially in governing bodies um, throughout mm -hmm. history. Governing bodies, uh, municipalities, we wind up with it, seeing it and often in, uh, in, in corporations. You know, I, I remember um, it was, uh, wasn't all that long ago where we saw, I mean, we've seen some ama amazing companies that you, you could never have imagined wouldn't be here like Enron that, you know, had, you know, billions and billions of dollars and miles of real estate, uh, incredible corporate power and, uh, and they're gone. <laughs> you know, I actually, um, Bob just brought up that it happens in churches and I actually experienced this firsthand, um, had a really just charismatic, um, on spirit filled on fire church when I was a teenager. And, um, you know, they felt led to build a new building and the financial burden of that building kind of put this greediness in our head pastor's heart. And he turned into someone different. And it was just enough of a foothold to let you know, the enemy come in and split up what was happening in the church. And it ended up where he did some, you know, really shady things to stay in that position when, you know, the elders came and told him he needed to step down for a while. And, um, you know, so we see that it, it happens everywhere. It's, you know, we're all susceptible to it some ways. 
Well, I think we're meant to hold our hands wide open. It's like, God, put in what you want, take out what you want. As for me, my hands are going to be open to you and your purposes. And I'm just going to keep my eyes wide open to what you're doing and seeing where I can join you in my marriage, with my parenting, with my, uh, with my places where you granted some authority. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hold that real loosely. Uh, and uh, it's when we close those fists and we try to hang on tightly to whatever it is we perceive in our minds as uh, of a supreme value. And when we begin to posture ourselves and jockey for positions uh, where we power up over people that there's no glory in that. It really is. A, it's an empty pursuit. And it doesn't even matter. You, you might wind up being really successful. It's an empty pursuit. Uh, it doesn't matter if the world looks and values your, you know, great church building or your great business acumen. Um, if you if you jockeyed for that position, you wind up with uh, with something that's very empty at the end of it. Do you remember that? Oh, I I think last time I gave the uh, start of the song of treasures. And the second verse goes, so I held my hands toward heaven and he filled them with the store of his transcended mercies until they could contain the word. And at that I comprehended with my feeble mind and all that God could not pour his riches into hands already full. Oh man, that is, yeah. that is great words. In fact, pray those words over us as a church, sir. I would be glad to. Father, I am so touched by the words in Luke, by the the stories in Luke, by those that are given to us specifically that we are to remember. And Lord, I ask that as we hold our hands toward heaven, that you would, as a church, fill our hearts and our hands with your transcendent mercies. And uh, Lord, I, I, I give you thanks for our pastors. I give you thanks from Mark and Todd and Josh. Lord, I think of Linfield over in Aiken, and I think, Lord, what a joy, what a privilege to be able to be there and give uh, give your blessing to the people that, that Mark and uh, Linfield are involved in pastoring. Lord, I just ask and I pray for everyone in our, in our study we, we we jokingly say the morning news, but, you know, there's so many things going on. And I just ask that you'd give us a piece of God that passes all understanding in reference to this. And the Lord Jesus will give you thanks in your name. Amen. 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 Good stuff, gang. And don't ever forget the morning news. That's good news. So <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, David. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day.